Well, who are you? As a person, you have many identities. When you meet someone for the first time, introductions are made. The first thing is your name, then where you live, how many are in your immediate family, what are their names and ages, what do you do for a living often comes up. And I assume that is the way it works in all cultures since the beginning of time. But these are just the surface identifiers for each of us. But who you are and who I am down deep is really revealed in our thought life. What do we dwell on in our downtime during our waking hours? You know, our thoughts are the, are the foundation of all that we are. I was one of the caretakers for my father in his later years while he was afflicted with dementia. I saw his total identity stripped away. He lost all awareness of the Bible, which he had studied diligently until he could no longer read it with comprehension. He lost much of his sense of right and wrong. One time I went to visit him, and I had tried to tell him to not serve him you know, pork and shrimp and all those type things. And and lo and behold, I got there right at lunchtime, and they brought and they laid a plate of, of fried shrimp right there in front of him. And he had, he had eat, not eaten unclean food for years. And and he started eating on it. And I said, well, he's not supposed to have that. And they started, to, and he just grabbed it. I like that. You know, so, you know, you just, you just, everything that we see as our our moral code can just, disappear with that with that terrible disease he said and did things that were not characteristic of him that was all because he could no longer think logically came across this poem uh, says author unknown says watch your thoughts they become words watch your words they become actions watch your actions they become habits watch your habits they become character Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. So today I want to talk about one of the tools for spiritual growth. This is a tool I've sometimes allowed to grow dull. That is the tool of meditation, the tool of constructive thinking. So the dictionary definition of meditation is to engage in thought or contemplation, to reflect. Some synonyms are to ponder, muse, ruminate, cogitate, study, think. You know, many, many religions practice a form of meditation, but not always the meditation as described in the Bible. In the Bible, meditation is never portrayed as a religious, mental, or emotional ritual. You know, some just say the same words over and over, and things, chants and things of that nature. The meditation as described in the Bible is simply directed thinking, reflection, contemplation, or concentration. You hear a lot about meditation from some of the Eastern religions, uh, uh, TM, uh, I can't think of the word right now. But, you know, and they basically, they just empty their minds, just an attempt to empty the mind, while Christian meditation fills the mind. And this oriental type meditation originated in false religion, which is dangerous and alienates us from God. Let's look at Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12, verse 29. We'll read down through 32. Deuteronomy 12, 29. It's in Deuteronomy 12, 29. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatsoever, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. And because we see a lot in the world's religion where they 
they adopt some of the the practices of meditation from the from the Eastern religions, the Oriental religions, which uh, this from this scripture it's, it's tied in with idolatry and all other types of worship that, that, that is not to be done. So and they want to say, well, how how do they do it? Maybe that's maybe that's the way I should do it. We are to turn away from that. There's several different in the Old Testament. There's the word meditate is mentioned several times through the scriptures, not as much in the New Testament. So I just wanted to bring out the the uh, definition of a couple of the Hebrew words and examples of where they were used in in the Old Testament. First uh, reference was be in Psalms one. We have our popular song in the in the hymnal. Uh, Blessed and happy is the man. Number one. When we probably we all learned when we came into the church, probably the first song we could could hymn that we could remember by memory almost. We sang it so much. I wanted to look at that. It says, "Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his desire, his delight, is in the law of the Lord." And in his law, he meditates day and night. Well, this, uh, the Hebrew word translated meditate here is, comes from H -A, uh, Strong's 1897, H-A-G-A, which means in part to utter a sound, moan, or mutter, the act of thoughtful deliberate, deliberation with implication of speaking to oneself. And I, I was kind of surprised at, at that definition when I looked it up. Uh, you know, sometimes if you're studying, you, you may be talk, kind of talk to yourself. And, and that's, that and that's, is a form of meditation if you're studying something down to that, that level. So that, that, was a, that was interesting. And then Psalms 119. And of course, Psalms 119 is all about God's law and how, how uh, the psalmist revered it. Uh, so it's repeated several times through this verse. We'll just look at uh, 119.15. It says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways, or to look into your ways to contemplate. So this meditate comes from the Hebrew... Uh, S I A H, which is seventy eight seventy eight in Strong's Concordance, which means to meditate, to muse, consider, think on, and so it's very similar to the uh, dictionary definition. So m meditation is basically talking about what we can think about, what we dwell on, even what we can talk we talk to ourselves about, when in regard to to the scriptures and to our our Christian life. You know, in, in Matthew 5 through 7, we won't turn there, of course, uh, Christ brought out obedience to God's law, uh, brought obedience to God's law to a whole new level. Obedience had to also be in the thoughts, not just in how we acted on the outside. That was his condemnation of the Pharisees. Is so much of theirs was on the outside, but inside they were, they were impure in their motives and, and thoughts. You know, sin is a violation of God's law, and it begins with our thoughts, the core of our existence. So we must always strive to direct our thoughts in the right direction, away from sin. You know, our mind is, you know, in this modern time, we, uh, it's almost like a giant computer. In fact, it would take, they've never been able to come anywhere near producing what each of us carry around up here between our ears. It's, it's, it's amazing. But would you like to have a printout of all the things that you thought about over a 24-hour period and have it posted? You know, Paul wrote in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, in, in, uh, we won't turn there, said to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, so it's, I don't believe I would want all of mine published always. So even though I have been striving to overcome many wrong thoughts and actions for many decades with the help of God's Spirit, I still would not 
want to post a printout of all my daily thoughts. There's some things that, that go through there that I probably wouldn't be proud of. They're not always controlled and directed in, uh, in the direction they should. You know, I've not succeeded in fully obeying this instruction that Paul was inspired to write to the church in Corinth. I came across a, a website, memoryverses.org, that had an article on how to meditate on God's word. And it brought out some things that we sometimes can meditate on that are, are not positive, what I called negative meditation. You know, some of these are just somewhat a part of our human nature. Some of them could be a result of our way we were raised, our formative years, or they, they could be also from this broadcast that Satan's putting out all the time that it, it impacts our minds. But ask some, it gave some questions to ask yourself about your thoughts. The first one is, are you critical of others? I'd have to hold up my hand and say, at times I have been. Second one, do you mope because you do not receive the praise you feel you deserve? How much time do you spend worrying about this or that? I don't think I worry as much as I used to. I think I, I used to be worried. I'd lose a whole night's sleep, especially when I was working and there would be problems at, at the office. Problems with one job I had was having a lot of financial issues, and I couldn't sleep at night. I was, how are we going to how are we going to solve this? You know, what's the solution? But I wanted to look at a couple of scriptures related to worry. Uh, Psalms fifty-five, Psalm fifty-five, verse twenty-two. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved, or my margin says to be shaken. So so this is to be where, where we go. With worry, we need to be able to turn it over, to stop just meditating and meditating on these problems. Matthew 6, Christ talked about worry. Matthew 6, verse 25. Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 25 says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than the food and the body more than the clothing? And then he gives the examples of how God, he provides for all of the wildlife out there. They all find their, their, their nourishment, their food. In the, in God provides all that. Talks about the, the beauty of the, the lilies and, and, the, and how that God clothes the grass of the field in verse 30. And in verse 31 Christ said, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the days, for the day is its own trouble. And that is... That is so true that these that worry can is something we 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 have a heavenly Father He will take care of us. The fourth item they listed was how much time do you spend grumbling or complaining or feeling sorry for yourself? How much time do you spend thinking about the TV shows or movies you watched last night? Psalms 119.37 will turn and says, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. And that's so true of, of our world's entertainment. It's, you have to be so selective in what you let enter into your mind through, through this entertainment industry we have today. Number six is how much time do you relive the bad things people do to you? I've spent a lot of time meditating on that. I have in, in, in different times in my life. 
Seven, do you list out all your misfortunes? Eight, do you allow yourself to be angry for long periods of time? And that, and that is another thing that can really, anger can really take over your thoughts if you're not careful. Do you think about bad things happening to the people you're angry with? Sometimes that, those revengeful thoughts can, can be going through our minds. Number ten, do you think about bad things happening to yourself? You know, it I, seems like as I've gotten older and working more with people a little bit older than me, I, I find people, some people are, they're, they're so fearful. They, they think about all the things that could happen, and they try to build this shield around them to keep anything bad from coming on them, and, and that's, that's their, their whole focus of their life is to, to avoid anything bad happening. And, of course, we don't want anything bad, but it, it, these things do come about, sometimes through no fault of our own. But does it, is it profitable to just spend a lot of time thinking and meditating on that? Eleven, do you rejoice in the misfortunes of others? Twelve, do you dwell on lustful and impure thoughts? Especially for the male mind, I think is, this is always a battle, the battle to keep our minds in the right place. Thirteen, do you glory in an important position you hold in church or at work? I've, I've come across some, in, in, even in the church, that they had some duty at Sabbath services and... And the minister come in and shifted that to somebody else, and and it was an, they they were insulted to that they they just couldn't why why can't I keep doing I like doing that job well it's time for you to move on to something else and and uh, but again so we have to watch for these little inside attitudes that can infect us. Fourteen, do you review reasons why you are better than others or better suited than others? You know this again goes back to. A certain amount of pride, pride that we have to try to get out of our system, out of our thoughts. Fifteen, do you list reasons why others you know are deficient in some way as compared to yourself? Let's look at Philippians 2, 3. Paul wrote about that. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. And then in Romans 12, verse 3, Romans 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So again, we, we've got to not be comparing among ourselves. This is a very, very negative way to be spending our thoughts and our time. You know, our answers to these probing questions can really reveal where our thought life is as of today. What have we dwelt on today? That is who you are today. We all want to be in God's kingdom. We all want to be a saint. And God has promised that to us, but first we must constantly seek to bring every thought into captivity. In the end, we will primarily be judged by what is in our heart. And the Bible speaks of the heart is primarily talking about the mind, what's in the mind. So what should we meditate on? You know, meditation is an intrinsic part of daily prayer and Bible study. What are you studying and praying about? Taking time during daily prayer and Bible study to really think about how those scriptures apply in your life can cement what you have learned into your mind. When you have a lot of other things to accomplish, we can shortcut some time for meditation. I know I've done that. I, I've got I've got this to do and that, and you know the physical sometimes overrides our our need to be thinking more upon the spiritual aspects. It's good to have a pen and paper handy to jot down thoughts as you meditate, as you study. It's so easy to not follow through if you don't write it down. 
When fasting, meditation is essential. As humans, we can easily let our thoughts go off in other directions when we are fasting. Focused meditation along with prayer and Bible study while you fast will make fasting far more profitable. In our United booklet on the tools for spiritual growth, page 21 has a box there and it lists items that we can meditate on. The first one is God's astounding creative power as revealed through his creation. And this is really uh, effective if you can get out among the creation. Uh, you know, I live in the city, and, and it's difficult sometimes to have that connection to God's creation as much as you do if you live out, out away. I, I have some land out in, out in the country, and I go out there about once a month, and, and I really enjoy it because I, I can just have so much more con- connection with God's creation and think about about how all that God has provided for us. Turn to Romans one twenty. Look at a few scriptures about on this point. Romans one verse twenty. Romans one verse. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are ma- made even his eternal power and godhood, so that they are without excuse. Talking about those who reject God, that that deny his existence, that that he's all around us, he's everywhere in in this creation, this this vast universe that we're a part of. Psalms 19.1, just turn there, back in Psalms, where Psalms is just full of, of praise for God and his creation, Psalm 19, verse 1. says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament uh, shows his handiwork. So just look up in the stars at night and see all of that and think, you know, our Heavenly Father created all that. He laid all that out. And then another psalm is Psalms 139, verse 13. Psalms 139, verse 13. And we'll read down, down through 18. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. So our own physical bodies are a marvelous creation. You know, it's just... Just amazing when you think about how this these uh, this DNA, as we've come to understand in the last few decades, how that that's carried on from all from the beginning of time to today. You know, it's it's just amazing. You covered me in my mother's womb, verse fourteen. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand when I awake. I am still with you. So that is another thing that we can, you know, meditate upon this this marvelous physical body that we've given, and and the, and the brain, as I talked about earlier, that helps us to to think and to draw closer to God as our Creator. Second item is how God is a father to us. You know, some people didn't have a a great relationship with their father. and but we have we have a father who truly loves us and cares for us in, in God. God's awesome plan as revealed by his holy days. And it's we repeat that every year of, of his plan and going through the holy days. Fourth is Jesus Christ's sacrifice as we're drawing near now to the Passover season. You know, we we really need to meditate upon that and what and the meaning of that sacrifice. Fifth was what the kingdom of God will be like both in the millennium and beyond. 
you know, it's we're, we're so accustomed to the way this world operates. It's hard sometimes. Uh, it's hard to think how would it be different if everybody was obedient to God. You know, there would be whole industries would disappear, and it'd be so much different than it is now. Number six is Jesus Christ, perfect example of God of what God wants us to be. Seven, Jesus Christ's teachings. How can we best live by them? Eight and nine is about the blessings and cursings listed in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Those are are good to think about and how how we are blessed in this nation and how we are blessed for, for obedience. Ten is how to overcome various sins. Eleven, the many promises of the Bible. Heard sermons on that, going through all of the promises of the Bible. Twelve, the experience of biblical figures. What can we learn from them? You know, there's a lot of great examples in the Bible. In Hebrews 11, you know, all of the, the great figures of the down through time. That, that we saw that they, were, they, they had weaknesses. They, they didn't always meditate in the right places either. But that they eventually they overcome and they were used by God. And 13 is read any section of the Bible and ask, what does God want me to learn from this? Let's turn to, to Joshua 1, eight. Joshua 1, verse 8. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. For med- so meditation is, is a critical, critical tool for each of us to use in our life. Meditation and self-examination go hand in hand. You know, when we meditate, we will often find where we come up short. We should pray that God will help help us see ourselves as he sees us and for the humility to see the need for repentance. You know, we've all got things that we're still working on. We're still overcoming. Let's turn to James 1, 22. James 1, 22. James 1, verse 22, and we'll read through 24. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he, he was. Again, it goes back to those making those notations. Is there something there that... You know, we need to repent of, to change when, we, when we're studying God's word, somewhere where we're coming short. So conclusion, we have seen that meditation is an essential tool along with Bible study, prayer, and fasting for spiritual growth. As much as I would like to one day say I've reached spiritual perfection and can just coast into God's kingdom, that's not the way it works. You know, we all want the the easy ride, but it's not, don't always work out. Don't work that way. Every day we must be seeking to grow closer to having the mind of Christ in us, to think like he thinks. Even as we can rejoice in the gift of salvation, we must be contending with our human nature and carnal thoughts, as well as the cultural influences around us, which are inspired inspired by Satan. Just Bible study and prayer alone will not bring us to repentance, to overcoming our sin. There are many great Bible scholars that aren't necessarily in a repentant state of mind. There are many who know the Bible frontwards and backwards and can even preach eloquently from it. But sometimes we find out their private lives are many times in opposition to what they teach. You know, it's just amazing me, just one after another, famous religious personalities find out they've got this other life they're living. You know, so they're not, they're not thinking about God's word 
every day as they go about or they would how, how could they get involved in those those type of of sins what God reveals in his word must be internalized if it is to change the heart the inner man or woman only through spending time to meditate on God and what he reveals to us in his word can we continue to grow towards spiritual perfection which will only be fulfilled when we are changed to spirit when Christ returns one of my favorite scriptures is Philippians 4.8. And this really just brings everything into a nutshell. Let's turn there. Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things.